title of this message is Consecrated Unto God. Consecrated Unto God. word consecration means to set apart. It could otherwise be titled set apart unto God. To be set apart and to be, in other words, separated or to be consecrated unto God. It is a position before the throne of God that I can scarcely fathom or preach. What does it mean to you, brethren, if I were to say to you that you are a beneficiary of God's presence? For God's glory. What comes to your mind. If I were to tell you that you are a beneficiary of God's presence for God's glory. Man has no power to glorify God. Man does not even have power to choose God or love Him. Except He first loves us, first chooses us, joins us together with the influences of His holy presence. And then and only then, when we have been consecrated, made holy, a separated vessel, a separated object of all the fallen sons and of Adam that are crawling upon the face of this earth, that you would, as the scripture would define it, be within time consecrated unto God. What would it mean to you, brethren, if I were to tell you that you have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ? For God's joy. That you have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. For the purpose of God's joy. That would communicate something of deep value in the heart of God as He looks upon you as a consecrated and precious vessel. Heathen men today store up in their homes or in fortified banks, jealously guard, even with paranoia, continually reflect upon and take inventory of the things that are precious to them. Sinners that would store up treasures in their homes would put them in a safe. Regularly on a casual day or just to enjoy himself, he would go and look upon the precious treasures, so to speak, that he has stored up for himself. Because he has considered these objects to be valuable. And they are indeed 
intended to be used for the man's own heathen purpose, for his own heathen pleasure, for whatever he thinks to be personally glorious. But what, what does it mean for us in this infinitely holy and pure engagement that we have found ourselves to be in as redeemed humans before a holy and righteous God to be instructed by the God of heaven that we are consecrated to Him. That we are valuable to Him. And we have been consecrated for His joy and we have been purchased by His blood that He might use us as a man would meditate spending his riches upon his own purpose of his own glory God has purchased for himself humans so that he would spend their life and their energy and their time on earth that he bought for his glory. title of this message is Consecrated Unto God, because when we understand the language or the descriptive terminology by which the writers of the New Testament have communicated salvation to us, you will find that it is most consistently and exhaustively communicated to us in the terms of Old Testament ceremonial acceptance before God. In this week of sermons, we're going to be studying the existence of sin and the terminology of an object that is to be damned that is abhorrent to God, that is rejected by God, ceremonially existing in the New Covenant as it was taught to us by shadows in the Old Covenant. We're going to be turning our eyes upon the realities that exist in parallel attributes as the shadows. In the Old Testament, we read terms like the unclean. We read terms like filthiness, pollution, impurity, corruption, blemishes, spots, Defilement, profanation. We read these words and with our Gentile mind that is not enriched by Jewish law, we can stumble upon these words in the New Testament and move past them without understanding the depth of what is being communicated. Because we were not as the Jews have been enriched by the law and by the covenant, put in a privileged position to understand who God is by receiving His law. When a Gentile mind picks up the New Testament, which is a reality of those shadows, and the Jewish apostles are communicating that salvation by the springboard of those shadows because there's no other way to comprehend what God has done except we first understand 
the centuries of preparatory shadows which will enable us to understand the reality. The Lord wasn't wasting time. And we'll look at these words and we'll move over them and, I, and we'll imagine, well, this, I know what this is like when I'm all sweaty and dirty and I feel dirty and I want to take a shower. Maybe that's what it's like to be unclean. All these rel- relativistic definitions of what God is saying is robbing us from the riches of what our salvation is in Christ. The objective of this sermon is not to study sin in terms of Old Testament clean and unclean laws in New Testament reality, but the purpose and objective of this sermon is to Look upon salvation and a very specific aspect of salvation, which is the fullness of what it means in God's eyes to be consecrated unto him. Terms of salvation or consecration in the Old Testament, ceremonially speaking, are words like clean, pure, without filthiness, without pollution, without corruption, without blemishes, without spots, without defilement. And this object or person that has received this legal identity before God in the Old Testament where he was a sinner, unclean, defiled, condemned, and doomed to hell. And then he becomes clean, pure, without filthiness, without pollution, corruption, defilement, profanation, etc. That transition from being damned to being saved, to being an object of abhorrence, to an object that is consecrated and even enjoyed by God. That transition happens in these words, ceremonially, these verbs. It's to be cleansed, cleansing, purifying, purging, hallowing, sanctifying, washing, sprinkling, and a sacrifice to absolve iniquity. In the Old Testament, in the paradigm of the ceremonial law, this was everything. If you were justified, it was not something that was disconnected with any of these verbs. If you were saved or savingly related to the living God in the Old Testament, it was and it meant that you were existing before God in the identity of the aforementioned verbs and characteristics. In the New Testament, we're going to be studying the doctrine of the clean and unclean as it is exhaustively expounded all throughout the New Testament. Not only 2 Corinthians 6, 17 through 18. It's exhaustively expounded throughout the New Testament and it's expounded through these terms. It is very True, that our salvation in Christ is altogether inconceivable if a man doesn't first understand Old Testament salvation via the ceremonial law. Our salvation in Christ is inconceivable to the Gentile mind. 
And as much as he enriches himself with the shadows, suddenly the realities will bloom and flourish with infinite greatness comparative to the shadows. You will feel as though indeed it is but a shadow. It is but a dark image on a wall. And now I have the real body, the real person, the real man right in front of my eyes. There will be such a drastic shift, a drastic illumination, a drastic change in the heart of a man who is a Christian in the New Testament, in the Gentile church age. If he can learn to identify himself before God Almighty as, quote, the cleansed. The holy, the purified, the purged, the sanctified, the washed, the sprinkled. And suddenly all the terms that the New Testament seeks to persuade the Gentile converted mind to draw near to an unapproachable and holy God will suddenly be realized. And then boldness rises in the heart. And all self-righteous or guilty-laden murmurings against the glory of God will be dissolved. Suddenly you will find that you are an object that is valuable before God, that is purchased by God with a great price, and that is in the hands of Almighty God for the purpose of His glory. And there's absolutely nothing you can do to change that. Is what He has already done. And when you realize what He has done and what He, in fullness of how He describes it, what He has accomplished already, you'll find no discontinuity in your heart or disagreement with what he wants to do now. If you agree with what he has done already, then your heart will agree with what he wants to do with you right now. You will not feel this contention, this division, this frustration of the grace of God, of the purposes of God. All the unholy thoughts or unholy desires that rise in the mind to keep a regenerated and blood-bought saint from the presence of God and from the instrumentality of His glory. You can and will be persuaded. It will be by the truth. By understanding the Word of God that He has preached in His written Word. It is an amazing thing when you look in the Old Testament the terrifying the boundless and furious anger and hatred of God when His special presence was in the near proximity of an abominable entity that he calls an unclean thing. It's dreadful. It's dreadful. To see the heart of a holy God in heaven nearly annihilating all of his beloved people in one moment of time Scarcely able to refrain himself from destroying them. That means that he is seeing something that is very hateful to him. See, through these terms, we can understand what God thinks, what He feels, and how.
how he acts. If I was a man in the Old Testament, or for that matter, in New Testament reality, and I am clean and pure in God's sight, and then I, by my own sin or transgression, morally or ceremonially in the Old Testament, I become unclean or I touch an unclean thing. The identity of that God-hated object just passed on to myself. And the fury of God's anger that is against that object has then become my identity before God. So as an Old Testament Israelite, I would endeavor to find cleansing. That I would no longer be an unclean thing in the sight of God. I would consider the law, attend unto the judges and the officers and the priests, find out what I need to do for my particular sin, whether it was a trespass, or whether it was another kind of sin. Then I would give a trespass offering or a sin offering, differing ones or differing sins. I would undergo the proper anointings of oil or the water of separation, which was sprinkling or any kind of washing that I would need to do. And any kind of sacrifice, which would be by my own money and by my own hard work. Of the most, the choicest animals I have or the choicest animals I can buy. And I would go and I would engage in this ceremony in hopes and in confidence that when it is completely fulfilled and all the word that he has commanded of me in this ceremony is accomplished, I will then be cleansed. And at that moment in time, I have then passed in identity out from underneath that abominable and God-hated and terrible, deplorable condition. And then into a justified, cleansed, pure, innocent condition before God. Now, when I was just speaking upon the unclean thing, and you read the pages of Old Testament church history, and you see how unbearable it was for God to endure the presence of an unclean thing. He would not endure it. And when people are given over to defilements and pollution and corruption and the land is defiled and the people are defiled, he will refuse to enter into the city because he would annihilate it, engulf it with flames, with his wrath right there on earth. He doesn't have to wait until hell. His hatred for uncleanness, his hatred and anger and fury against what he has diagnosed, descriptively diagnosed as the things he despises, that he will annihilate, that he wishes to eradicate. When you are in that identity, you feel the force of God's anger abiding upon your tabernacle. You feel frantic. You feel in need of cleansing. You feel the weight and the enormity of his anger. And you don't want to preside in that identity before God any second longer. What are you understanding? You're understanding the abominableness of a God-hated object. The abominableness of a God-hated object. What is that? It's an unclean thing. 
to filthy, polluted, impure, corrupt, blemished, spotted, defiled object. That's what it is. God has spent centuries annihilating thousands and millions of people, even the whole world at one time, to show his willingness to destroy anything that falls in the category of those attributes. And the New Testament isn't changed. In the New Testament, it is still yet again in the Gentile church age. These are the terms that God uses to express the intensity and the fury of his, his disgust, his absolute disgust, his absolute abhorrence of these objects and people and cities, anything. And the Jews were taught by fire, by blood, by graves, by tears, by pain. By famines, by swords, by captivities, that God will cause his anger to fall upon anything and anyone that exists in that identity before God. It is inevitable. And thus, an instructed saint of the Old Testament would feel the divine energy of his wrath. They are emanating from the Godhead and he will seek relief. But brethren, the purpose of this message. The objective of this message, brethren, is that we would come to realize. The antithesis of. The aforementioned situation that we would come to realize not the inescapable and terrifying and dreadful energy of wrath and fury that is falling upon an object that is unclean, but the contrary. What is the contrary? When somebody is cleansed, purified, sanctified, sprinkled, made pure and holy and consecrated before God, what happens? Are they merely delivered from a force of anger and then they abide in some kind of neutral state before the Godhead? Where we can say that his wrath merely was pacified. And now we just live. Is our salvation only to escape death and to escape wrath? Or is it something more? Is our salvation merely to escape wrath, to escape destruction, to find forgiveness? And once that is removed, that weight of anger and, and terribleness is removed and we have a new identity, then do we just live our lives? We've escaped death and now we live. Is that all? Brethren, we studied in Deuteronomy 27 and 28 this exhaustive explanation of God speaking what he will do on behalf of what he feels towards his people Israel. And he will bless them or he will curse them. And it is. A very sad and terrible robbery of the Christian faith. When all we understand about salvation is escaping wrath. And that is all. 
You're forgiven and then you can go to heaven. Brethren, when I just described the unfathomable intensity of God's anger upon an object that is unclean, filthy, polluted, impure, corrupt, blemished, spotted, and defiled, when that person transitions from that identity into what he calls clean, pure, without filthiness, without pollution, without corruption, without blemish, without spot, and without defilement, you are not existing then before the Godhead in some kind of free atmosphere of your own will, and you could just do your own will, and there you are as this free agent in the world, and you've escaped death, and now you just live your life, and you have your own will, and you have your own goals, and you have your own ambitions, and you're just a Christian now that is forgiven, and that's the greatest thing about it. No, the unfathomable explanation of Scripture, it speaks of this this contrary force, not of wrath, not of anger, but of love. This unsearchable, Ephesians 3 says, this unsearchable, unknowable, all-expanding force of God's love that you cannot know the height and length and depth and breadth. You'll never search it out. You can never number the depths of it. You can never number the height of it. You'll never know the expanding influence of it. But God makes your soul to feel when you are transitioned into an identity of what the Bible ceremony calls as the saved man, you are put underneath the energies, the divine energies of his loving kindness. And when you study the pages of scripture and you find the saints of the church of the Old Testament, They learned that when they were purified, sanctified, consecrated before God, they were then commissioned to do the impossible. They were commissioned to walk through a sea on dry land. He said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? As they were standing there at the Red Sea, and he said, bring the people forward. What does it mean, brethren, when we become consecrated unto God? There's something very fundamentally wrong with the Christian mind and the Christian heart that does not have an expectation for God To use them for His glory. When considering the objects of God's wrath, there is an expectation that God is going to annihilate that object for His own glory. When a man undergoes the spiritual salvation of God, whereby he becomes consecrated... There should be an expectation of the fullness of God's love and desire and joy and rejoicing to be invested in that object, in that person, and that he might be engaged in a purpose for his own glory. They become a beneficiary of God's presence for the purpose of his glory. with most, even all backslidden Christians, and most Christians of the 21st century, they live the Christian life without this deep-seated expectation in their souls. So they will peruse the pages of the New Testament 
and never find the gates of heaven being opened up before their faces and beholding the riches of his inheritance in Christ and finding echoing down the corridors of the heavenly palaces into the chambers of his heart commandments to do the impossible to live for God's glory that you would be an object in His hand and He operates the purpose of His righteousness in the midst of a world He intends to captivate. And suddenly when you see this, this opening up of, of what it means to be saved, to be consecrated, there is no separation between you and the purpose of His glory. When you are reconciling yourself to your legal identity before God in heaven, you will feel the unstoppable floods of God's love towards you as a consecrated and cleansed vessel that He's chosen for His glory. And as all of your hearts are stirring, desiring, meditating, I believe this. I've experienced this. But I feel I can't maintain a yielded soul in confidence and expectation before God that this is my identity. Therefore, this should be my expectation. Therefore, I should effortlessly walk in his glory in my life right now. And that is the reason I'm preaching this sermon. It is because you are, though you understand in a shallow level these terms, you are not persuaded that this is your legal identity before God. And when you commit sin, and this legal identity is frustrated, depending on what sin you've committed. There can be a disillusionment because the Christian continuously goes in and out from this position of glorious and rapturing grace and love being expressed from heaven down upon his soul because he's so inconsistent and wavering he becomes disillusioned he doesn't know what he's doing how to get there and he didn't know how he got there how to get back there what his sin is why he committed it how to stop committing it and a disillusionment and a blanket of, of discouragement and unbelief resides upon the soul Brethren, I'm here to tell you as your pastor in the Lord that it's because you're not understanding this doctrine. So consider with me, brethren, as we look at this doctrine, consider with me the heart of God. When we become the cleansed, the hallowed, the purified, the purged, the sanctified, the washed, we can remember the words of Moses in Exodus 33, 16. He was praying to God during the great pause and he said, For wherein shall it be known that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are on the face of the earth. Moses understood grace to mean God's presence. And indeed, that is what instantaneously happens to the soul of a Christian when he begins to reckon the truth of his consecrated condition before God. He immediately feels God's presence. That is the greatest lamentation 
of true Christians, it is when they feel distant from God's presence, when they feel alienated in measures from God's presence, when they feel that they are grieving, as Ephesians 4 would describe it, God's presence, when his joy is turning to grief, when your cleansed conscience is turned into corruption. In Leviticus 15.31, the Lord said, Thus shall ye separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, that they die not in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle which is among them. Separation from uncleanness results in God's presence. In Exodus 33:16, it results in God's present continuous abode. In Leviticus 15:31. But what else? What what is a more personalized language that we could hear that would Make us believe in the love of God upon a consecrated object. Leviticus 20. Leviticus 20, 22 through 27. I'm going to quote to you lines from that passage. Leviticus 20, 22 through 27. The Lord says, I am the Lord your God, which have separated you. See, in each of these... Th- three verses that we've just addressed, the word separation is used. The word consecration, separation. He said, I am the Lord your God, which have separated you. The same thing that he said to the former situations. Moses understood God's presence separated them from everyone else on earth. In Leviticus 15, 31, God said, thus shall you separate. And the moment he found a separated people, that's where he wanted to be. That's where he desired to dwell. That's where he wanted to come. The eyes of God goes to and fro throughout the entire earth, scanning the land, people, city, and every heart. And if he finds any heart, That is separated from uncleanness. He will leave the very lofty and high and holy place. And he will go and be with that man. This is how God views. How God values. How God very friendly and with terms of endearment is saying, I want to be with you. I want to be with you everywhere you go, everything you're doing, when you're lying down, when you're sleeping, when you're waking up, when you're speaking, when you're teaching your children, when you're eating food, when you're going out, when you're coming in, when you're facing war, when you're facing calamity, when you're facing trial, when you're planting your your seeds in the farmland, when you're doing anything and everything. From learning, to warfare, to farming, to merchandise, to the economy, to a kingdom, to a law. Everything and anything becomes lavishly baptized by the presence of God. And it's because he wants to be there. He wants to be there. He says he uses terms of endearment. He wants to be there. You know what that means? Leviticus 20, 22 to 27, he says, I am the Lord, your God, which have separated you from other people. That's what he says. Separated you from other people. I have separated you and ye shall be holy unto me. For I, the Lord, am holy and have severed you from other people that ye should be mine. Verse 26. He said that ye should be mine. Do 
you see the glory of that? The Lord looks upon these people, these redeemed individuals, and he says, you are mine. I have come to you. Now you belong to me. Every man on earth protects what is his own, values what is his own, infinitely more God. He says, ye should be mine. What does he say? He says that you should be mine. This miraculous salvation from the prison house of Egypt This baptism through the Red Sea, this ceremonial consecration at the mountain of Sinai, this delivering of the law and flames of fire, the writing of a book of Leviticus and and numbers as a history account and Exodus part of it, the latter end as, as more laws and Deuteronomy as sermons. He's saying you are mine. And now you you live for me. You exist for me. And everyone on earth now who's going to know me, they're going to know me by knowing you. You're mine. And I'm going to use you to witness to them. You have my name now. And I'm going to reach them by glorifying myself in you and through you. And my name is going to be known by you. You have become mine. You become an instrument, a vessel of my own name, of my own glory, of my own family. And everything you do, I want to do it with you. There's nothing ever in every thought of every moment of every day that I will ever be absent from you. I will be there. And as much as you yield yourself to me and believe in me, you shall sense and know that I am there. That's what he's saying. You shall be mine. I have separated you that ye should be mine. He did it that you would become his. This was spoken in Leviticus 20 to every Israelite becoming a prized possession of God. He spoke to the Nazarites in Numbers chapter 6 verse 2 to the Nazarites, not the Israelites. The Israelites is the entire body, the entire population of the redeemed people. Now he's speaking to a greater and more specific consecrated people in the midst of his consecrated people, the Nazarites. And what does he say? Number six, verse two. He says, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when either man or woman shall separate themselves, consecrate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves. What is he saying unto the Lord? The Nazarite, if, if an individual Israelite is ambitious to become a Nazarite, he is ambitious to be more specifically and more especially unto the Lord. And thus he shall enjoy and know the Lord. In a deeper and richer and more glorious way. Our Lord himself was a Nazarite. He says unto the Lord. That that doesn't mean unto some, some chamber where God keeps his treasures. No, God is omniscient. He's omnipresent. If you're saved, you're for him. He doesn't need storehouses. He doesn't need anything, and staggeringly, shockingly, though he didn't need us, he wants us. He wants us. He does not desire to glorify his name on earth with some separated purpose or separated operation that is distinct from the objects that have been consecrated for that very mission. They exist for that. If you're consecrated, you're consecrated for his glory. 
If you've been cleansed and made pure and sanctified and sprinkled, if you are clean, your expectation should be immediately to, to receive and yield yourself to the divine energy of an, His incomprehensible love and acceptance of you, that He would lead you in the purpose of His glory. We saw in the Nazarites in number six, but well, let's look at a greater tier of consecration. The Levites, Numbers chapter eight, verse 14. <clears throat> Numbers chapter eight, verse 14. Thus shalt thou separate the Levites from among the children of Israel and the Levites shall be Mine. All of the Israelites were his. The Nazarites were more especially his. The Levites are his in a superior way. These Levites are to draw near to his very throne on earth. The atmosphere absolutely Filled and enthralled and electrified by the divine energy of his presence as his person exasperates and overwhelms all of heaven's creatures. That's what's happening at his throne on earth and all around Israel. He says, these blessings shall fall upon you and overtake you. Do you know what that means? The Lord doesn't bless his people in some some mechanism that's separated from himself, some some distinct energy of salvation. Somebody suddenly falls upon you and you're captivated by it. It's just this this cloud of of energy. Now, if God is going to cause his blessings to fall upon you, his very own presence will be near to you will overwhelm you, will overtake you, and will use you in the purpose of His glory. And what that meant for Old Testament Israel was that every nation on earth staggered in amazement at the God of Israel. So He said to the Levites, The Levites shall be mine. The Levites became the Lord's by the blood of the firstborn of the sons of Egypt. If that is a consecration, there is a greater consecration among the Levites, and it's the priests. Turn to Exodus 29. Exodus 29, verse 1. Do you believe that God wants to be with you, brother and sister? Do you believe that you are his? Exodus 29 verse 1. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them. To minister unto me in the priest's office. And in verse 9. And thou shalt gird them with girdles, Aaron and his sons, and put the bonnets on them. And the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. And thou shalt consecrate. Aaron and his sons. They were consecrated to minister to the presence of God Almighty in the throne of God on earth. Now some of you brethren would be in your unconverted condition, your heathen mind and heathen flesh before you're saved. If you're invited to the president's Oval Office, let's say a president that you agreed with in your carnal understanding, your heart would be pounding, you'd be filled with anticipation to be in the Oval Office, wondering what the president, the most powerful man in the United States and arguably the world, depending on what generation we were in, what he would say to you, what he wants with you, why you're going there, what he is going to invest in you for. Is he going to give you 
a place of authority? Is, gonna, is He going to use you for some purpose in the government? Is He going to somehow make you an ambassador of His rule? What is He going to do with you there? You would be filled. Your imagination would be filled with amazing anticipation with how privileged you are, with what honor you have, walking side by side by bodyguards, going through these these doorways into the Oval Office, the most consecrated secular arena in all of the nation of America. You will be filled naturally with anticipation, with amazement, with expectation, and you would want to yield yourself to whatever He says in your heathen imagination for your own glory. That you might have honor, that you might be a part of something that's bigger than yourself, that you might have this, this relishing sense of accomplishment because you're part of something bigger than yourself and there's something great happening. Because you're in the presence of the greatest man in the nation, or arguably the world, who has a, the greatest power and military, all at his beck and command. Well, brethren, that is very shallow and infinitely infantile compared to where we are right now. And what is so evil about unbelief is that though we understand in the sense of acknowledgement in our conscience that everything I just said is true, we have not labored to fully comprehend how and in what way, with what purpose of glory, with what anticipation, with what, with what usableness are we existing right now before the presence of God's throne? It is that we have not labored to understand where we are, who we are in Christ, and for what purpose of His glory. And so that we can be in the presence of God Almighty, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, be consecrated, standing there. And the hearts in this room are not expecting to hear the sound of the King of Heaven in all of His authority and in all of His zeal to glorify His name. Suddenly... We're in the presence of an incompetent king. And we, consecrated vessels, are unusable for his glory. And suddenly, we're not expecting him to recognize that we're here, that he's going to speak to us, that he has something he wants to command of us. He has prayers for us to pray. He has burdens for us to understand. He has laws for us to comprehend. He has sermons he wants us to preach. He has ambassadorial missions he wants us to go and journey upon. He wants us to face conflict and succeed. He wants us to face death with fearlessness. He wants us to go and laugh upon the powers of the devil and tread upon serpents of scorpions and turn the world upside down and it starts right here. Recognizing that we have been consecrated to the King of Kings for the purpose of His glory. And it begins with you agreeing with the legal terminology of your acceptance that you've been purchased with His blood that you might live to minister in the organic fullness of His sovereign kingdom for a purpose that is unfathomable with a love that is inconceivable with a power that works within you that He cannot even pray and ask to the even bounds of which He attempts and He will accomplish. There should be a bowing down a bowing down of our souls, a bending of our souls before in worshipful adoration before God, before Christ. Expecting any moment as we're 
feeling the sense of holy angels flying around the spiritual atmosphere, the heavenly demons and heavenly fallen angels fighting on the very extended regions of the circle of glory that surrounds the people of God that have been congregated to the King of Kings. And we're here to be endowed with power, to be given gifts for His kingdom, to be given missions to journey upon, doctrines to preach. <clears throat> the Lord says of the priests, they are consecrated to minister to Him. Those were the greatest men on earth. And in your heathen mind, this depraved and foolish aspirations, it's the men around the president, in the midst of the president, and the president himself. He's the greatest man on earth. That's the greatest thing that's happening on earth. With all the investment of all the technology and all the inventions of science and all the classified things that nobody knows about and all the astro astronomical journeys and everything they're doing to try to find out all their own glory to be the best, competing with all the other nations that God divided with their tongues. It's pathetic. It's pathetic. It's vanity. And we're serving an eternal God with an incorruptible blood. We've been consecrated to God for a purpose of His glory to get their attention. And they don't know about it. We have a gospel that shook the Roman Empire by fishermen walking down with sandals, proclaiming with their tongue the kingdom of God and the entire spiritual atmosphere was melting away. When they were gathered together in that upper room, brethren, they were expecting the ascended and glorified Jesus Christ to do something greater than he did when he was there in bodily form. He said, because I go to the Father. He said, do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me in John 14? He says, if you believe in this and the works that I do, greater shall ye do, because I go unto the Father. Even in His resurrected form, scars on His body, having just gone down to hell, got its keys, preached to the spirits in prison, came up, resurrected before them, preached to them the mysteries of the kingdom of God. What was the greatest mystery, brethren? He says, I go to the Father. I go to the Father. And when I take my seat at the right hand of God the Father on the day of Pentecost, I will pour out upon you the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, and you shall be endowed with power from on high to be my witnesses. And I have a greater work I will do with you than even that I did in my own incarnate body. Greater work shall you do. Those men and women in that upper room, brethren, understood the meaning of consecration. Because inasmuch they understood that they were consecrated, they immediately were joining together the fullness of the name and majesty and glory and purpose of God on earth with their instrumentality. That was the purpose of their consecration. It wasn't consecrated to God for nothing. It wasn't for personal peace. It wasn't even for personal forgiveness merely. It was for God's glory. That's the greatest thing on earth. That's the reason the world exists. We can read in Exodus 40... Verse 9 through 16, we can look at the doctrine of con consecration from a different angle. Exodus 40, 9 through 16, it's the consecration of the tabernacle, the material housing. Material housing. Tents and animal skins. A design that God author that man was supposed to build and consecrate to God by ceremonial consecrations of sacrifices and oil anointings and water sprinklings. 
sprinklings and blood sprinklings, etc. And you read there in 9 through 16, they're hallowing the vessels. They're anointing the altar. They're sanctifying the altar. They're sanctifying the laver. They're, he's instructing the priests to wash themselves with water, to put on holy garments, to anoint themselves, that they might minister to God. And he goes on from verse 1 all the way through verse 32. The entire consecration of both the people and the material objects of the material housing and all of its furniture. Verse 32, when they went into the tent of the congregation and when they came near under the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses and he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. It was finished. The entire doctrine of ceremonial consecration was completely performed. What happens? All the attention and the affections of God Almighty is turned towards that place. And he descends down from his throne in heaven and he inhabits this material housing. And this housing becomes branded and umbrellaed by the very reputation and name of God. Whatever you do to this tabernacle, you're now doing it as a direct offense against God. Anyone who comes near to this tabernacle, they are coming near to God. Anyone who dares to offend anything near to or inside this place, they are offending and profaning the presence of God. And what happened? Verse 34, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. We have Christians, authentic Christians, burdened for revival, burdened for God's glory, burdened. To see his glory, to walk in his glory, to know him personally, to know him intimately, to know the secrets of his mysteries, to know the secrets of his glory, to know the secrets of his kingdom. And brethren, we're in his very throne room and we've never come to understand the doctrine of consecration. Brethren, when those priests reared up that temple, when Moses reared up and all the ceremonial consecration was completely performed, they expected God in the cloud of His glory to fill the tabernacle and they were filled with holy anticipation as they watched on. What do you think God expects of us if He calls us consecrated, sanctified, pure, innocent, forgiven? If we only understood our Christianity in this language and did away with all the garbage of our own relativistic understandings of what Christianity is and are gauged ourselves in the reality of where we are right now, the glory of God would fall. It would be given to us according to our faith. That which is true, we would feel it to be true. That which we seek, we would see it before our eyes. We would know, tangibly understand, tangibly comprehend, be fully enveloped in the glory of God, the biblical Christ in our midst. And it would bound effortlessly with omnipotence to the ends of the world to exasperate heathen society to say, God is in the midst of those people. Robbed from their tongues is that evil, jeering sound of blasphemy. Where is their God? By the sheer, unexplainable, 
an indisputable expression of the glory of God in their midst. That's the reality. Consecrated unto God. Do you know what happened when the tabernacle was consecrated unto God? It became his. He said, this is my house and I will fill it with my glory. And I will make everyone know that this is the house of my glory. According to 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20, we have been become the temple of the Holy Ghost. According to 1 Peter 2, 4 through 6, we have become the spiritual house of God. According to Ephesians 2.21, we have become a holy temple. In Ephesians 2.19 through 22, we have been built together for a habitation of God's presence. We have become the most holy place on earth that God will fill with his glory. When and if, by faith, we yield ourselves to the identity of a finished and glorious consecration in Christ. Brethren, when we study the doctrine of consecration through all these shadows of the Old Testament, there's no greater argument than what happened upon the cross of Christ. When Christ became sin on the cross, the fullness of God's wrath against sin was absorbed by the body of a sinless man and he died as a legal sinner that fully absorbed the imputation of all of the guilt of fallen humanity he completely absorbed the wrath of God he drank the entire cup every drop of the wrath of God himself for 33 years that he lived and walked on earth he never committed one sin as a full human being God as a man. And he, he, being a man, had the faculties to sin, but he, being God as a man, conquered all temptation and all things that we would personally experience as sinners and more. And he defeated it overcame him. He sinlessly trusted in God the Father, sinlessly relied upon God the Father, and sinlessly expressed the presence of God the Father as God the Son in the faculties of a man. The faith that he lived as a man, he wishes to live again in us. The life that he lives to God, he desires to live in us. And the death that he died to sin, he died that he might live to God in us. When you consider the fullness of the wrath of God being poured out upon the hanging 
and brutalized and bleeding body of the Lord Jesus. And understand that the full volume of wrath was absorbed by him. If we can then understand the terms of our consecration before God by faith and yield ourselves to God, our expectation should be that because the fullness of wrath was absorbed by Christ, the fullness of God's love that was upon Christ for 33 years, enabling him to be an instrument for God's glory, will then fall upon us. Wrath fell on him so that love falls on us. Curse was placed on his brow that a crown of life is placed on ours. He was cast down that we might be lifted up. He was smitten, wounded, bleeding, and bruised that we might be healed, sewn up, bound up, and made whole. He was thirsty that we might never thirst again. He was hungry on the cross and fainting for energy that we might never hunger and never fail in the energies of righteousness. He absorbed, endured, paid for, confronted, suffered the agony of all of our curse that he might then give us and use us in the operation of his glory with all of his righteousness, with all of his mercy, with all of his love. We have been consecrated in God's love that as wrath sees Christ's love would seize us. That as he died we would live. That as he was buried we would be raised. That as he suffered we would never die. We have been consecrated. We have been consecrated to be the body of Jesus Christ who now has omnipresence. He had reasserted his divinity upon his, his death. And his spirit went in down and it came back up, resurrected his body. He ascended into heaven. He's omnipresent. He dwells inside of us. We become the very material housing of God. We become the very material housing of the inhabiting presence of Jesus Christ. And what's the world to know? He's still alive. He wants to live, speak, do the very same things he did. He wants the world to know the love that was upon him is upon us. And the only way we will be able to open our mouths wide and drink down the fullness of the outpouring of God's love if we understand our consecration. And we understand the personality of our God, namely his goodness. That before sin ever existed, God was good. Before humanity ever fell, the sincere desire of God was to create a paradise. If there is no sin, mankind will experience a paradise of glory in God. That's the nature of who he is. All of the earth worships and glorifies God. All the material creation on earth, scripture says, worships, glorifies, stands as a memorial of the glory of God. All the devils in hell are going to bow their knees one day. All the, the, the demons in heaven, in the heavenly places, all the evil spirits everywhere, all the, 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 the darkest and evilest human beings that have ever existed, they're all going to bow their knee. And they're going to worship him and say, Jesus is Lord. And all of heaven is ceaselessly exercised by glory that is exploding 
from the presence of God that is in their midst. They're always worshiping Him, always loving Him. They are always full and, and fully intoxicated with joy and holy admiration and holy worship and holy and sober devotion and self-sacrifice for His causes and for His purposes. They're in a paradise. And before man ever fell, before sin ever existed, God looked upon man with happiness, with joy, with rejoicing. He walked in the midst of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden with joy. They would talk with him. He would speak to them of his glory. He would show them his glory. He would show them his creation. He would include them in this mysterious purpose where they would know him and he knows them. And they have a relationship and they're worshiping him. And he's having joy in knowing them and them knowing him. That's what happened before the fall. The only thing that frustrates this inevitable personality that's in God is the existence of sin. The only thing that stopped the paradise of perfect and holy friendship and union between man and God was the existence of sin. Before the fall, there was a paradise of God's glory. And Adam and Eve were exercised by that glory. After the final consummation, the complete eradication of sin in the new heaven and new earth. It says in Revelation 21, 21 verse 3, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God was with, with men. He shall dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And listen what it says here. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Do you hear the personalization of this redemption as God, as a father, he comes and all the tears that you've ever shed. He has them in bottles, every hair that you ever had. Uh, he numbered it. Everything you ever did, every crevice of your body, every pore on your skin, everything you've ever said, every word you've ever said every thought you've ever had he was there with you he was thinking upon you his thoughts upon you are more than the sand the sand upon the seashore and there he is he's raptured you into eternity he's captured you he purchased you with his blood and now he's brought you to himself and now he's wiping away your tears he's wiping them away with his own divine hands with his own divine, intimate powers, as John laying upon the bosom of Christ in the incarnated body. Here we have the fullness of redeemed humanity there, joined together in friendship with God. He says, he wipes away their tears, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, brethren. In this paradise, it's impossible to be sorrowful. You cannot be sorrowful. There is no sorrow in this land. There is no sorrow in any heart. There is no sorrow in any mind. There is no ability to think sorrowful thoughts. There is no unhappiness. God created happiness. He created joy. He created rejoicing. He created enjoyment. He created things which make the heart cheerful in a holy and righteous way. And there... Expanding on into the recesses of eternity, he says, there's no more sorrow. There's no more crying. There will be no crying son and daughter in all of the new earth. There will be no crying. It will be impossible to cry with the lamb's face shining like the sun with no night. It will be impossible to cry. Neither shall there be any more pain. No more pain. Brethren, in the Garden of Eden, it was a environmental paradise. You have never seen what once was in the Garden of Eden. There is nothing that has ever existed that is comparable to that. And there will be nothing greater than the new heaven and new earth. It will exceed the glory and the paradise of the Garden of Eden. 
walking amongst those, these, I'm sure, gigantic and illustrious just environment, just the most beautiful thing. If you've ever been to a rainforest, if you've ever been to these, these glorious jungles with creatures and, and colors and birds and songs and, and just the firmament declaring His handiwork and the, the, the air is filled with moisture by, by waterfalls that are nearby and just everything is just flourishing and green and healthy and the animals are lively and it's just this this otherworldly paradise of wealthiness in the environment. I'm sure Adam and he were walking around just gazing upon it all, feeling the presence of God as if every tree and every animal and everything was worshiping God, was, was created for God. It's like the redeemed eyes that are looking upon the sunrise and there it is, it cracks the darkness of dawn and all of the light shines throughout the particles of the heavens, creating an illustrious and glorious artwork before the eyes of all humanity. And they're all holding their breath, gazing upon it as it takes a rise up into the sky. And all the elements change colors and it rises and it gets brighter and brighter. And they shade their eyes and every second it gets brighter and brighter until they have to turn their face away from the glory of what God created in the firmament declaring His handiwork. Creation worshiping God glorifying God standing there as a memorial of His goodness flowers filling the surrounding regions and these rainforests it's filled with, with smells of sweet smells healthy smells fertile smells your, 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 your nose your eyes your ears are filled with the sensations of, of a living organic ecosystem that has been created by the glory of God Psalm 19 said their line has cut into all of you. No language is their voice not heard. That is what it was like before sin interrupted the love of God. When he created Adam and Eve, he perfectly loved them, perfectly enjoyed them, perfectly welcomed them, perfectly was endeared to them. He never had an angry thought of them. He never had a frustrated thought of them. He was always delighting in them. Everywhere they looked, every expression on their face, every word they uttered, he was there looking on happiness with enjoyment. And they took God with happiness, with enjoyment, with worship, with holy stillness before God. No carnality, no frolics and foolishness, no lightheartedness, no vain thoughts, just there admiring God. God and man in perfect unity, sinless harmony. That was before the fall. It shall be greater after the fall. That was before sin came. The consummation of the new heaven and new earth. That shall be after sin is eradicated and the fullness of a greater redemption. We've been adopted into the family of God. We're experiencing the everlasting union of the love of God between the Trinity, sweeping us into the family of God. And there we are, joint heirs and sons and daughters of, of God Almighty. Worshipping and casting our crowns before the Trinity. For all eternity, no more death, no more pain. Do you know what it was like for Adam and Eve, brethren? That was before the flood. That was when there was water in the firmament. There was water in the sky. It was like a greenhouse effect that was sheltering the earth from the harmful rays of the sun. The entire atmosphere was in a different pressure because the water that was in the firmament and it was it was increasing the oxygen in the air. And when you, if you've ever been in a hyperbaric chamber where the pressure is increasing and oxygen is increasing, you have energy levels. You feel like you could run 15 miles without growing tired. And if you grow a tomato tree in a hyperbaric chamber, it grows twice the size. Everything that is in this pressurized and sheltered environment of a greenhouse in a hyperbaric chamber, which is a similitude of what it was like before the flood. Everything is bigger, larger, flourishing in a greater glory. And you, you can run faster. You can run longer. You don't get tired as fast. You live longer. You grow taller. Everything's different. 
And you can imagine Adam and Eve just walking light-footed all throughout the Garden of Eden. He's going miles and miles throughout this glorious rainforest, and he's not even tired. He's not even tired. He's race just there in the fullness of joy and energy like he was seven miles back. And he's there just grabbing fruit along the way, these illustrious creations full of sugar and enjoyment, just full of the delight of God. God said, I want to make them taste my goodness. They said, wow, this is wonderful. What is this? Strawberry. There was all kinds of fruits. We don't even know about what was there. The angel of God guarded the garden of Eden with a flaming sword, brethren. We don't know what was in there. It was the paradise of God. It was God's happiness with sinless man. And that's an unfathomable experience. God's happiness with sin cleansed and forever sinless man at the final consummation of new heaven and new earth. That is an unfathomable experience. This is the personality of God. Before the fall, after final redemption, when there is no sin, the fullness of God's personality that made the flowers smell good, that made the honeybees work all day long meticulously, making honey and sugar for your enjoyment, the God who made rain, the God who made lightning shows, the God who made sunrises and sunsets, the God who stuns you with His own goodness in literal creation. The God who is inherently good. And if you know him and there's no sin between you and him, he amazes you in his goodness. He makes you worship him for his goodness. He makes you love him fervently and incessantly and uncontrollably and forever by his goodness. By a display of his goodness. He's engaging you into an eye open confrontation of his goodness. That's who he is. That's inherently who he is. That's his personality. That's his nature. That's just simply who he is. That was before the fall. That will be after final consummation. Brethren, beloved, when a sinner is redeemed, when he's cleansed and purified and made holy and consecrated and sanctified, and he's without defilement, without corruption, without pollution, and consecrated to God Almighty in the midst of a vile body, and God sees no sin... The fullness of that personality is re-engaging the fallen man. And you are reconciled from what was lost. And you are expected to embrace the fullness of his personality. The fullness of his love. The fullness of his enjoyment. The fullness of his meticulous fascination. In creating you. In numbering the members of your body. In writing them in the book. In creating them in the lower parts of the earth. In numbering all the hairs of your head. In thinking about you a million, billion, innumerable number of, of times in eternity past. He desires to fascinate you by his love and goodness towards you. Because between you and him, there is no more sin. You're consecrated. You're consecrated. And even more so, brethren, when the fullness of the wrath of God was swallowed up and absorbed by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it was so that the very embodiment of love that He expressed for 33 years, namely in the three years of His ministry, He desires to express in the world right now, you and I, as the body of Christ. And that is an impossible mission and an intimidating mission unless we are drawn, strengthened, encouraged, animated, and made valiant by the goodness of God making us be amazed and worshipful of who He is. If that is the means by which He is going to compel us to be instruments for Him. Simply us believing in the personality and nature of who He is in our consecration to Him and our sinless and innocent relationship to Him in the righteousness of Christ. Reckoning that and believing in it. His glory comes and His glory carries you and I in the operation of His glory.
It's Him. It's all of Him. Through Him, to Him, because of Him, for Him. He is the preeminent one. He takes the supremacy. He's enthroned. We're His captives. We die, He lives. That's the message. Do you want to know this, God, brethren? Lift up your eyes with a full assurance of your consecration joined together with His personality. His glory will fall. His glory will fall. As I was meditating on these things to preach to you, brethren, such waves of glory were coming upon my soul, I felt they were almost more than I can endure. Where I would be tempted to pray that they would cease because of the painfulness of the power of the enjoyment of what I was experiencing. It was so enjoyable to me. It was painful to my human body. But brethren, I want I want to even still more deeper yet resign as a consecrated one before God. Brethren, the fullness of God's desire towards us is that in the midst of fallen humanity, the scheme after the fall and before final redemption, the scheme of God's glory in between those two beginning and end points. God has predestinated that in the midst of fallen humanity, He would grab a hold of the affections of consecrated, redeemed human beings. And He would serenade them as a man serenades a woman he desires to marry. He will woo them, enthrall them. He will seek to romance them, so to speak, in a holy way, so to speak, to draw them into the bond of marriage. And if God has could identify what he intends to do in the scheme of fallen humanity by a metaphor, it is that he wants to get for himself a wife and a bride. And he wants her to love him. And when she looks at him with one glance of her eye, He is ravaged in his heart. He is so affectionately and zealously and jealously in love with this bride, this collected, redeemed individuals which exist in parabolical language as his wife. He wants to make them love him. And he wants them to see the love that he has to her. That's the romance of redemption. God gets for himself a wife. A wife. Psalm 19, brethren, declares the glory of it. Psalm 19 declares the glory. In verse 1 through 6. Says the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto night uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. 
their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. The psalm opens up in verse one through four, declaring the glory of God in creation, namely how creation itself is illuminated and awakened with glory and with praise at the rising of the sun. And just as humanity is captivated by the sunrise and the light giving rays come at the crack of dawn and illuminate the particles of the atmosphere and awake the birds to song and make the snakes go hide on the rocks and make all the, the screeching crickets go hide away in damp, dark places and go make all the reptiles and poisonous, evil creatures go hide away in cover and then all the birds awaken with beautiful feathers and beautiful songs and a glorious expression of flying, beautiful birds of, of sea creatures leaving Leaping into the waves of all the colors of, of, of creation being animated in the nature of what was created. The sea is crystal blue. The sky is crystal blue. The clouds are bright and caught in white. And everything is animated and made alive. As the sun rises and rises, the heat gets stronger and stronger. And creation hides its eyes from the glory of the strong man that's running its race, of the rejoicing of the bridegroom that's taken its course and it's begun the race and it's going across the course over the whole atmosphere of the earth, exercising creation with his passion and with his joy and with his rejoicing. The Bible says the sun is as a strong man running a race, as a bridegroom bursting out of his bridegroom chamber, rejoicing over a bride. That is the scheme of redemption. God Almighty animating His spiritual people, exercising them with the light that shines with His face, causing them to behold the unsearchable glories of the things that are of heaven, so much greater than the similitude of God's goodness on earth. He is as the sun, as a strong man, as a bridegroom, with joy and rejoicing, filling the world of redeemed humanity with his glory. And at noon high, all shades are gone. And noonday's coming, brother. We're just in the morning. The Son of God's taking his rise now. One day there shall be no more night, no more shadows, no more darkness. Nothing shall be hid from the heat of his righteousness. The sun is as a bridegroom, verse 5, coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. If there is no more sin, if we are a consecrated vessel to him, and we believe that. We will presently and continuously experience that. If we take it lightly, we'll profane it. If we believe it, holy, sobriety, holy, fear, trembling, and are fully yielded to it, we shall incessantly and increasingly experience it. We shall experience what's written in Jeremiah 32, verse, verse 41, where the Lord said, I will rejoice over them to do the good. We will experience what God said in Isaiah 62, verse 5, where he says, As the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. We shall experience what is written about the Exodus generation, where it said that he, meaning God, rejoiced over them the Lord rejoiced over you he says to do you good and multiply you in Deuteronomy 28 63 when all of the the fullness of God inhabited Israel and as creation itself is illuminated by the light 
brilliance and heat of the sun and gives all the world life. God, by His love and His personality, illuminated physical Israel in the Old Testament so that everything they did and everywhere they were, His blessings overtook them and fell upon them. Everything they did prospered. God's consecrated people were walking in friendship with God's glory, the personality of His love, when there's no sin frustrating. It's powerful. It overtakes man. Man doesn't overtake it. It falls upon man. It overtakes man. All that needs to be done is the eradication of sin, the consecration of the sinner. That's all. <clears throat> the purpose of beginning this week of messages with this message on consecration. The purpose for beginning this week with this message is because until we understand the goodness of God and the love of God via the consecration of the sinner by the salvation of Christ, Till we understand His love, His goodness, His faithfulness, His personality, we cannot properly understand our sin. Because when we sin, we are sinning against His love. And we are resisting what is inevitably there, whether we want to believe it or not. We are sinning against His love. We are, in the deepest part of our heart, disagreeing with His love. And in our mind, we can enjoy it and chew on it and taste it. If it doesn't become the very high tower of our refuge or fortress of our hiding place presently and continuously, the very mind and heart by which we look upon God, relate to God, associate with God, we are fundamentally disagreeing with what He says about Himself. And that is sin. And what we're going to study in the coming days, brethren, is sin as it exists in relationship to this great salvation. And when man, in the deepest part of their heart, is, and they consciously know this, is not fully agreeing, fully receiving what they know to be true, just simply because they don't want to, or they're afraid, or all these other sins, it's called evil Unbelief against what God the Holy Ghost is witnessing to their conscience and making alive in their soul. They're refusing to yield themselves to the divine influences of the Spirit of God, which causes them to know the truth through the Spirit. It's not an intellectual disagreement. This is a resistance of God the Holy Ghost. And when Christians who are consecrated behave as though they are not consecrated, and when Christians who are sanctified present themselves before God without expectation of His glory, then they are disbelieving that they are sanctified, and they're disbelieving that they're consecrated, and they're disbelieving the personality of God, and they're acting as though God is dead. They're walking in literal transgression against this host of all the riches of the Word of God and the knowledge of God in the New Testament. And it's not just intelligence. It's actually through the very hands of God that are pleading. They're actually walking in resistance of God's Spirit. Who's wooing them? Who's serenading them? Who's rapturing them? Who's capturing them? Who's fascinating them? And they're resisting it. 
And one of the greatest sins you see in the scripture, beloved brethren, is when God takes his beloved, consecrated, sanctified, and saved people gloriously by his own miracles and power. And he brings them into what is called the trial of faith. And they encounter physical circumstances or spiritual circumstances where they're conflicted with a situation which is tempting them to believe that God no longer loves them and God is no longer with them, even though they know he is with them and they know he loves them. And they disbelieve it and then they murmur. They complain. Like the Israelites in Exodus 15, going to the waters, the bitter waters, going three days into the winters without food and water. Their beasts, they had bottles, I'm sure, of water. Their beasts were going thirsty. They're walking very lethargically. Their children are being carried. They're crying. They're tired. Three days in the wilderness, they arrived to an oasis. The glory of God just parted the Red Sea. Their former slave owners and brutal taskmasters are under the ocean waves, dead. God said, I called my son out of Egypt. They went three days in the winter. They arrived at an oasis and the waters were poisoned. They looked upon and rejoiced. God has led us. We're not going to die in the wilderness. With the pillar of fire, so to speak, leading them in front. With the pillar of cloud, so to speak, leading them in front. All of their affections, all their desires were in the presence of God. They were being exercised by the pre-incarnate Christ. They weren't walking through the wilderness just as dead men. They were praying in their hearts. They were meditating upon the word of God. Moses was preaching to them, I'm sure, every day. The priests were preaching to them, I'm sure. Aaron was preaching to them. The Levites were preaching to them. Somebody was. There's somebody who's godly. Somebody among that multitude. They were preaching to them. The princes. The authorities, so to speak. The elders. They said, trust in God. He's with us. You know His presence is with us. He hasn't left us since the Red Sea. I feel His presence right now. I know He's with us. I, I'm feeling the righteousness, the fountain of goodness, the fountain of holiness. I still love Him. I know He's faithful. He said He'd bring us to the promise. That he promised us. Moses told us. And they know God is with them. It's like what 1 John chapter 5 says, the witness of the Spirit was with them. And if they were going to fundamentally disagree that God was leading them and God was with them and God is now choosing to kill them. They're denying the identity of their consecration, of their salvation. They're fundamentally disagreeing with the personality of God. And God says that is a murmur. That is a complaint. That is a disagreement with his love. And people die when they do that. When God takes consecrated individuals, brings them into a conflict, a trial, to test them, to see whether they are going to believe what they know to be true. And all of us know what I have preached thus far is true. And all of us, different measures, each of us have tasted the depths of it in great glories and inutterable, and unspeakable glories of grace. Some of you maybe even now, while you're listening, the past hour, you are, you are experiencing it at present. But you find a fickleness in your heart. You find a feebleness in your heart. You find when the elements of the world are beating down upon your body and there is no water and there is no, nothing around, any hope in sight. Are you going to trust in God just by His Spirit? Just because He said it was true and His Spirit witnesses that it's true. Are you going to yield to Him? Are we going to yield to Him? This is the trial of faith, the test, if his people are going to believe. And the Israelites arrived at the poisonous water. They murmured against God, and they did that after Sinai, and people were dropping down dead. That's the essence of apostasy. It's a fundamental disagreement of God's love and the purpose of his glory in the face of trial. That's the, the root of apostasy. That's the root of all sin. Unbelief. Against the forces and the divine energies of love, which makes men believe. A stubborn resistance against the spiritual influences of God's love that we know is true. We must stop. We must stop. 
We must learn to believe, brethren. We must learn to yield. We must fear God and yield our souls to God. This must not be a momentary sermon. We must labor to continuously and more fully understand the very legal claims of the blood of Christ in our consecration and yield ourselves in friendship and union with the presence and personality of God's love that we might be empowered to walk out in His glory. We must labor to understand that. And we must see the sinfulness of sin in any slight, in any little, in any word of disagreement against that from the depths of our soul. Because we're denying the greatness of our salvation. We are thinking little of the price that Christ paid. We are thinking little of the wounds that are upon his body. And as he bled, and as he was wounded, and as his flesh was ripped open, it's so that we would be healed. And if we're going to fundamentally disagree that God wants to heal us from our sins, we are disagreeing with the very sufferings of Jesus Christ. We must not do that. We cannot do that. We will not do that and persevere. No man goes to heaven while disbelieving fundamentally in the depths of their soul, the very core of God's love in their consecration. And though the righteous man falls seven times, he always he gets back up again and believes again and goes all the way and takes the mountain of the promise. But he then reengages himself again in the fundamental thing that he already knew, and he yields himself to it, knowing that he cannot be saved without it. Brother, we must learn uncleanness in terms of unbelief. Ephesians chapter four. Verse 29 through 30 speaks of uncleanness. And I'm going to close with this as a as a meditation for the coming sermons. Ephesians chapter 4, 29 through 30. This is what it says. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Okay, the reason that you're here in this room is because if you're, if you're a saint here... It's because you are consecrated, you are regenerated, you become a habitation of God's presence. God the Holy Ghost is inside of you. There's nothing you do, say, or think that is outside of His presence. You become the temple of God. You become the special and holy location and ground on earth. The temple of God, you become a consecrated vessel that He has enjoyed and delighted and cherished to come and be with at all times. And when we fundamentally disagree with the purpose of his love in our consecration to use us for his glory at any significant point in thought. And then we express that in word. He says it's corrupt. Unclean. The word corrupt is a term of Old Testament ceremonial uncleanness. We're going to study this in detail. It's unclean. When it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, that we must cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness, the corruption, in other words, of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It means that we need to stop speaking words that do not agree with what we know is written in the fullness of the volume of his love for his glory in our instrumentality. It is corrupt. It is a spiritual pollution coming before the face of a holy God. And it grieves him. And it will make him depart and turn away his face and chastise us. Because we're speaking and thinking thoughts that are fundamentally in disagreement with what he says he has bought us for. It's his glory. 
You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Some of you in this room have never one time in your life believed that you are going to be used and you are going to be a part of the organic kingdom of God, which is going to reinstate the glory of the biblical Christ in New Testament proportions. You've never believed it one time in your regenerated life. That's a fundamental disagreement with your consecration. And as long as you're thinking thoughts and speaking words that are fundamentally in disagreement with that blood-bought destiny, it is a corruption. It is a spiritual pollution. And he looks upon it and he says it's filthiness and he's not going to come in our midst in his glory. He says, cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. This is unholiness. If you disagree with the purpose of your consecration, you speak thoughts and speak words that are in disagreement with your consecration, and it's a spiritual pollution of uncleanness. And it will spot you, it will spot others, it will spread like a canker, it will eat like a disease, it will spread like leprosy, it will spot the blood of Christ. And that beloved, blood-bought, sanctified, holy, beautified bride that he's destined to rapture in his love and and, and romance with his glory and make make her live for his glory in the midst of an adulterous world of wicked sinners and the Antichrist defying him boldly. They're all crippled and spotted with leprosy, ceremonially disqualified for the marriage. And this bride's not going to walk the aisle with spotted garments. She's not going to walk the aisle, brother. The the ceremony of the marriage of Christ will be stalled. God will strive with the people. And he'll find a generation that's going to seek him. And ascend his holy hands with clean hands and a pure heart that will agree with the purposes of his love. When the New Testament Christians in the first century gathered together in the upper room, they were in a parallel situation to the Israelites going three days without food and water, arriving at the poisonous waters in the wilderness. They were surrounded by a Jerusalem that had forsaken and crucified the Lord of glory. They were all overtaken in the poison of depravity and the poison of satanic captivity. They were all darkened. They were all alienated from God. They were all hating God and hating them. And they were there in that upper room. And they believed that when the former rain fell and when God's love was commenced, And when the fullness of their consecration in the New Testament sense was enacted and the Holy Ghost came upon them, they would receive power to be his witnesses, to carry in their hands the fruits of the tree of life, to overcome poison, to turn the eyes of Jerusalem back to God. They didn't look upon the poisonous waters. They didn't see, oh, it's so poisonous, it's so terrible. Anybody who drinks this is going to die. They didn't look upon Jerusalem and consider the deadness of Jerusalem, the poison of depravity, and worship the devil. They were worshiping God. They were worshiping the power of His love through the commencement of the covenant by the endowment of power from on high. They believed through the tree of the cross these bitter waters would come sweet. They didn't murmur. They didn't complain. They didn't disagree. They patiently waited and fervently sought. God came. Anything else is corruption. We are sealed to redemption. The course is set. Your election is sealed. You are a chosen vessel. You've been fully sanctified, fully consecrated. Are you going to believe it, son and daughter of Jesus Christ? Caleb and Joshua were setting their eyes upon the promised land, being one of the one of the twelve spies that searched out the land for forty days and forty nights. They looked upon that land. They looked upon those giants. They looked upon the high walls and the, and the high bulwarks and the glorious vintage and the glorious illustrious graves and all the things that are ready to be inhabited by them and possessed by them and inherited by them in the face of impossibility. Because they were fundamentally in the depths of their soul agreeing that God is with them. God is leading them. The fire of God is before them. The pillar of God is before them. He resides in the tabernacle. He's with them. They are the church of God. His purposes are sure. And he delights in us. He will do what he has said he wants us to do in us and through us. And he gave us the promise and he'll take it for us when we charge. Fully armed. Charge. And if God is wrong, they die. 
Caleb and Joshua set their bread, all of them. Millions. Cities of giants says they're just bread. They were in the deepest part of their soul agree with what God said in Deuteronomy chapter 1. That I have given you the promised land. It's already theirs. It's already Joshua's. It's already Caleb's. It's already his. And they went to take it, brother. They went to take it. No devil on earth was going to turn their face away from it. That is the heart of the Apostle Paul, who is traveling around the province of Asia, hearing reports of the apostate Corinthians. He set their eyes upon the Corinthians, and he says, I'm coming to you, Corinthians. And God is going to give me this mountain. And I know about all the false apostles and the false prophets and all these heresies and this, this, this fornicator and all these other unclean things that y'all are doing. I know about all this. I'm going to come. And it's not by the flesh and not by my own right arm and not by wise persuasive words of man's wisdom and not by an argument of words and intelligence or in bodily presence or in the base things that, that carnal men compare one another by. He says, I'm going to come and I'm going to know the power of which you speak. Because the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. I'm going to come and I'm going to find all the full works of the heresies that are holding your thoughts captive into sin. And I'm going to tear them down with the weapons of God's righteousness which are mighty through God. When I come, I will not, I will not be defeated. I will not be hindered. I'm coming in the power of God. God has given me you as an inheritance. You're the bride. I'm going to present you to him spotless. That's the covenant. You're sealed. I'm coming to take what's his. That's what he said. He fundamentally agreed. In the depths of his soul, he believed it. When you believe it, the person of Jesus Christ will come and appear before you and operate in you to accomplish those things which you believe. You try. You fast and pray. And you start laboring to believe the things that I'm preaching you for the past hour and a half. Brethren, beloved, what you'll find is suddenly from the very heights of heaven, the living person of God makes all your emotions alive, makes all your decision faculties agree, and suddenly your heart is one with his heart, your affections are one with his affections, and you see and feel that you are able to do what he's calling you to do in the fullness of his glory. Suddenly, one moment of time, and you're bowing down in worship, just being exercised and permeated and pulverized by his grace. As dust and ashes before his glory. The greatest temptation that you will endure if you are falling under the billows of his love, passing over you, billow upon billow, as you believe the simple statements that depict God's mind and personality through his written word. If you experience that, the greatest temptation will be that it's too good to be true. That would be the greatest temptation. You know, it's too good to be true. Surely, no, it's not true. This can't be my daily experience. This isn't my calling. And that, again, is a fundamental disagreement. We've got to see the sin of this. We've got to see that it's corruption. It's uncleanness. It's defiling the, pollu- the atmosphere of the throne of God. God is not pleased with that. By the pureness of their lips, the king is our friend. We need pure lips. We need pure speeches, not corrupt speeches, not corrupt communication, not unbelieving thoughts and unbelieving words and unbelieving gestures and unbelieving prayers. We need pure hearts, clean hands. A heart that fully agrees, that says God is true. And the first step for us Is a wholehearted yielding to this covenant, an understanding of it, a contrition over our fickle unbelief and a violent pursuit of what belongs to us in Christ. God will come. When we have fear and trembling over corrupt communications, proceeding out of our mouth understanding the consequences of that that it repels instead of invites the rejoicing and joy of God in our midst whereby we will have 
everything we ask in the name of Jesus. And we will experience all the fruitfulness of His glory. And we see that that is the consequence. That is the robbery. Having visions of His glory. And seeing our sins against His glory. And seeing the stature of His holiness. Whereby we can maintain friendship with Him. Namely, touching not the unclean thing. Speaking no spiritual corruption before His presence. God will come. God will come. And he will do what He did in the former reign, but then in the latter reign. And it will be greater than what formerly happened. This is our calling, brethren. We need to understand New Testament uncleanness as it pertains to New Testament consecration. Only then will we have proper parts of humility, brokenness, contrition. God will receive us in our sinfulness and cleanse us of all unrighteousness and conform us to His person day by day as we call upon Him from this point on. With all of our hearts, He will come.